this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the third Sunday of the month, which means it's time for Heart to Heart with Dr. Columbus Batiste. He is a plant-based cardiologist, and today he's going to show us what's new in the news and answer a few of your questions. Please welcome him to the show. How are things in Southern California? Oh, they are back being sunny, and sunny oh. is always good. Always I know good. I've been wearing I've been wearing like hats every day, not this kind of hat, but like s snow hats. And it's it's actually getting warmer here, too, which I do appreciate. Yes, yes. You know, I mean, it's crazy because in California, we oftentimes we're always wanting rain, but there's been so much rain. I think even I've, I've been like, OK, I need, it's time for some sun. I need sun so I can get outdoors and do some things, uh, you know, between work and everything. Yeah. Does sun affect our heart health at all? It does. I mean, that's the crazy part. The great part about it is that, you know, we store nitric oxide beneath our skin, in our skin. And so when we get outside and we have measured amounts of sunlight, what that does is it releases the nitric oxide, which can lower the blood pressure, as we all have learned over the years, which impacts the endothelium. Right. And so this this is it's so powerful when we look at the connectivity between the sun, our mood, um, actually on the physiologic perspective, there's power that's here. And I think that I believe is one of the reasons why, to be honest, there's been such a disparity in terms of the vitamin D literature out there. So some vitamin D literature just seems like, okay, we know deficiency is so impactful in terms of disease outcomes. But when we supplement with it, it's been kind of muted in terms of the response. And I wonder if the vitamin D is more of a surrogate for sunlight. You know, and that the real true power comes from measured amounts of sunlight. Now, obviously, we're living inside of climate issues and, and things that have happened. And so we have to be careful about excessive radiation that can, can lead to skin cancer. So we have to be wise about it. But at the same point, there is value by getting that sunlight, um, the vitamin D from that, and so subsequently our immune system, our cancer prevention, and our heart health. Nice. It seems like yeah. all, it's just all about all the pillars of lifestyle medicine working together. It is. It is. It is. It's all, you know, you can't have one without the other, right? You can't, right. you can't just have one, one aspect. I want to petition the American College of Lifestyle Medicine to add another pillar, which is pets. You know what? You're right. And there was a great study and I should have put that inside what's new in the news. And I just forgot. I overlooked it. But there was a great study looking at pets and walking and what it does to our mental health. And that literally just came out. I ran across that study. I didn't get a chance to dive in deep. But it was another positive study speaking to the power of having our our, animal, our companions. Right there, there Next with us. Next time, I, I would love to hear about that because I, I don't hear a lot of the doctors talking about it. And I feel like that's the best thing for one's mental health and oh. physical health if it's a pet that you can take outside and walk. Absolutely. Well, I mean, just, you know what, you got to make sure, you know, you're going to get a copy of the book, but we got, you know, when you get the book Selfish, I'll actually talk about the power of plant of pets and our, our companions in terms of the intimacy and what it does to our heart health and to our mood and our stress. Do we have a release date for the book yet? It's still shooting, still somewhat nebulous. I'm going back with the publishers. End of April, though, for sure. I was excited. So I, I don't get excited that often, although sometimes I may sound, people say whenever I'm talking about nutrition and vegan and plant-based eating, I get excited. But here's the thing. I just got like a, a copy of the book. Um, to look at the soft version of it. And I was just excited. I was, I was looking through and reading it and making sure there were no errors and preparing it for everyone there. So we are anticipating this release and shipping out for those. Thank you for those of you who've already done your pre-orders through drbatiste.com. And we're, giving, we're setting up the Amazon site too as well that you'll be able to get it from there shortly as well. And I, I haven't announced this yet, but I guess we will. If you want to get it from Dr. Batiste in person and have him sign it, we are having an amazing plant-based conference up here at Weimar University, which is near Sacramento on July 7th. And he is one of our uh, esteemed speakers. So that's another possibility. We'll get that information to you by next Sunday for sure. Love it. Can't wait for that one. Yeah, Can't yeah. wait for that one. Yeah, we have a book signing room and everything. So <laughs> love it. Love yeah. it. Cannot wait. Great. So what is news new in health or heart health? 
Oh man, you know, there's always so much that is new out there. And so, you know, I just thought this would be a unique opportunity for us to kind of share with the listeners out there some of the things that just come across our desk. It doesn't always mean that. So I'll just full disclosure, just think about, about whatever your favorite news channel, 24 seven news channel that kind of, they give you that quick one liner about the what's new in the news. We're going to do this today about what's new in the news in plant-based world. I know many of you out there were expecting to see my friend and colleague, Alan Desmond, um, but he's abroad across the pond in England and and he wasn't able to make it last minute. Some things came up and we understand life happens. And so that's the case. But so we decided to shift gears and do something new. So we all know there's so much about this processed food, right? That means it could be vegan and non-vegan for processed food. It means, as I like to say, it melts in your mouth, not in your hands. That's how you know it's processed. It's pre-chewed food. That means as soon as you put it in, it starts to dissolve before you start to chew it. That means it's processed, ultra processed. And there's a major uh, uh, amount of our food products that are. And so recent study kind of came out looking once again at the hazards of ultra processed food. And they looked at different additives, which we know these are one of the major contributors for that shelf life, those stabilizers, because food that's processed doesn't decay right there it doesn't decay as opposed to real food that's alive and so additives such as multi multi uh, dextrin they promote a mucus layer that's friendly to certain species of bacteria that have been found in greater abundance in patients with inflammatory dis disease so one study is kind of mentioning they talk go on to talk about that when mucus layer is not properly maintained the epithelial cell, that's that lining that's there, becomes vulnerable to injury. We talk about this when we talk about heart disease and the endothelium. And that has been shown in studies using carrageenan as another type of, of additive in humans and other studies in mice models. So these things trigger an immunologic response. And so these this response, basically it leads can lead to and predispose you to colon cancer, other inflammatory disorders. And this is one of the hypotheses as to why we're seeing colon cancer. So March in the United States is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. And so we know that there are increased rates of colon cancer inside of our youth and in different segments of the population. And some of this may indeed be attributed to our consumption of these ultra processed foods. And so we really need to kind of look at these things. And so this goes, to, remember, vegan doesn't mean healthy. Right. You can say I always say it's our greatest enemy. Our common threat is the standard American diet. You can't standard, standard American diet, vegan style, Mediterranean style, uh, 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 all different styles. And so it becomes so important for us to be careful about the foods that we eat. Now, another moving on to another say that was done. We talk about protein. And most people, when they think of protein, they think of animal foods, animal proteins that are there. And so in this particular study, it looked at combined small humans trials experience with uh, experiments in mice as well as in the petri dish and what they found is that consuming over 22 percent of your dietary calories from protein it can lead to an activation of immune cells that play a role and guess what atherosclerotic plaque formation that means when the hardening of your vessels that means coronary artery disease carotid artery disease all these different things but here's the catch that the scientists basically discovered that it's one uh, amino acid in particular called leucine that seems to be the main driver inside this, this connection that's there and leading to the stiffened vessels. And that leucine is related directly to animal protein. So it's not, we need to get off this protein, you know, and, and that's why, like Dr. Davis says, you know, in proteinaholics, it's more of an issue. We are so fixated on protein consumption. Now, as a side note, we know there's such a major onslaught of the use of Ozempic, and that's perhaps... Chef AJ is maybe a discussion we have on another time. That would be a great discussion to have. And we look at the role of GLP ones, and we look at the impact that's there and how it can be triggered by, um, you know, the the effect of fiber. But when we look at Ozempic and these other types of of weight loss agents. Part of the thing is that people are losing muscle mass, and so there, there is even this increased drive that's being put out there in discussions about increasing the protein intake. But on the contrary side, we're seeing that this drive towards more and more protein consumption is not necessarily helpful for us in terms of our cardiovascular um, uh, outcomes. So ultimately, we have to all ask ourselves, what question am I trying to answer, right? Is my question, how can I achieve the best health possible? Or is my question, how can I lose weight as fast as possible?
Those are separate things, which means the pathways may be different and they may not be consistent in terms of what the outcomes are. Um, another say, great one. We have so much that's increasing over sugar sweetened beverages, right? sodas and juice and things that are devoid of fiber and micronutrients and so forth. And we're seeing this. And so another state basically kind of was just saying that you cannot out exercise, right? All these sugar sweetened beverages, it's not going to, to, to help. And we understand that it increases your risk of cardiovascular events, irrespective of your physical activity. So that means that as you're there consuming your, your high energy drinks, which we know are, can increase your heart rate, increases stress, on the vessels and destabilize prone towards arrhythmias that have a higher sugar consumption, that these things can increase cardiovascular events and your exercise, right? That movement is not enough to offset this. Another study basically to the armament. And so we remember, I haven't dug into these in depth, but we're giving you a high level news um, release as it relates to some of these things that have been out over the past couple of months and since 2024. Another one looking at artificially sweetened beverages. Now, this one is impactful because what it does is talking about the risk of an arrhythmia, the irregular heartbeat. So remember, for those of you out there, the heart is very rhythmic. The heart is very, that's why I love the heart, right? So one, it, it acts on its own part of the autonomic system that's there and it beats in a regular cadence. And I always describe it, there's a light switch that triggers the heart to beat. That's called the sinoatrial node. And it sends out the signal that emanates from the top chambers and converges inside of a central stoplight called the AV node and then disseminates to the lower chambers. And so what ends up happening is that when you have this irregular heartbeat called atrial fibrillation, you have this chaotic sense of beating that's happening and it's usurping the power of that light switch. I always uh, uh, describe it, it's almost very similar to like if you, you ever watch the Olympics and the lights go out and you see, and it's before they show, they shine the light in the center stage, you see all the cameras blinking just a thousand time, uh, times now a, a minute. That's like what happens inside of the heart. All of a sudden you have all these stimulus, these triggers that are stimulating for the heart to beat at nearly a thousand fold compared to where the, uh, the normal sinal atrial node. And so the heart gets bombarded by all these signals and it starts to beat chaotically. And this, this chaotic beating leads to twitching of the muscle of the heart, which means blood can stagnate and clot can form. When clot forms, that can lead to strokes, that can lead to other what we call embolic, which means it embolizes, it's delivered, it's sent out to the system and can lead to problems. And so what this study basically told us is that increased consumption of what? of artificially sweetened beverages increases the risk of atrial fibrillation. But here's the catch. They talked about individuals who drank two liters or more per week. That's about 67 ounces. That essentially means about 12 ounces of diet soda a day. How many people do you see drinking two, three diet sodas a day? They're like, oh, I want to be healthy. I have to keep myself buzzed and ready to go. And they're drinking this, increasing their risk. And here's the thing. Many times atrial fibrillation is silent. It doesn't take a lot to lead to a stroke and the adverse outcome. And we're seeing the rates increase over time. So great study, kind of giving us more awareness, more armament to kind of advise you as patients and for us as physicians and clinicians to make sure we direct things. Now, this is an incredible study that came out. Now, I'll tell you, it's a very concerning study. We're all increasing awareness about the impact of our environment, right? That's part of the idea is that our choices in food sometimes can lead to environmental changes. Our, the way in which we, we consume ultra processed and plastics and our desire to recycle and be a part of the environment, these things all play a role. We're all interrelated. Everything is. And so our system, what this slide is demonstrating is how our system basically is integrated and how we're developing as a result of our waste, as a result of our habits that these microplastics, these breakdowns are getting into the landfills or getting into our water system and into our food. And so there was a, a study that just came out of the New England Journal of Medicine. And it's the first of its kind that basically showed, demonstrated evidence of microplastics, small plastic particles in the artery plaques. They found this and that it's increasing the risk of heart attack and stroke and death. And so, you know, the mechanism is unclear but the relationship was definitely present. So whether or not that relationship pretends to increase consumption of processed foods or to 
to levels of animal proteins out there, fish and other things for increased consumption of, of microplastics, it's hard to say. Right now, we need further studies to tell us. But we're knowing, we're understanding more and more and more the presence of these substances is indeed related to um, increased cardiovascular events there. And so I had to follow up with some hope, right? Some hope. And so another study of environmental science and technology has found that when you boil your mineral-rich mineral water for about five minutes, it can reduce the amount of these microplastics you're exposed to about to 90%, especially when we're talking about consuming them from water uh, substances there too as well. So what about ultra processed foods and, and levels of attractiveness, right? <laughs> so this is a crazy say. So I have no idea. This is more uh, 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 observation than it is actual uh, mechanism, although we'll have to bring in one of our Durham colleagues and, and really go through the mechanism of how this applies. But this study was interesting done in France. And what they did is they gave one group of participants a high processed breakfast. Well, one refined carbohydrates is going to boost your, your sugar levels. We understand that. And the other received kind of fiber rich, low glycemic uh, breakfast. That means that the sugar content, free sugar was very low. It was wrapped in fiber and so forth. And then they had heterosexual volunteers. This is what the state was based on. They were asked to rate the facial attractiveness of the opposite se sex participants as captured in photos taken two hours after eating the breakfast. <laughs> so their analysis showed that when you, after consuming this, this high glycemic breakfast, now I'm not sure if they were tired and lazy and their face started kind of changing, what started happening, it was associated with lower subsequent facial attractiveness ratings for both men and women. So this kind of builds upon other studies that speak to kind of the presence of, of aging. And so we understand that there's a process that begins to happen. If you start to dig into it, even without me going in depth in this study, I understand that there's a process called advanced glycation in products which typically occurs from high heat products of when you fry your meats and you're grilling and those grill marks, you're getting a lot of these heterocyclic amines and you're getting these advanced glycated end products. These things have been shown and the binding of proteins and sugars have been shown to increase the risk of, of wrinkles as well as cardiovascular disease, <laughs> as well as uh, diabetes and many other instances. So it kind of starts to make sense why they may be seeing this. Now, I'm not certain in terms of what types of refined foods, carbohydrates, and in what context, but it all starts to build together that our health is tied to what we eat. Our functionality is tied to what we eat. Our future is tied to what we eat. Our environment is tied to what we eat and what we practice and what we do. Now, I love this one. It goes back. I'm a, I'm a history buff. I always joke around and say I would have been a history professor. And so Ponce de Leon, we know, was searching for the fountain of youth, right, back in the day. And so Walter Longo may have found a, a way to the fountain of youth uh, um, as well as kind of talking about the fasting mimicking diet. And that we understand that it lowers some of the burden and the risk of disease, but also this recent study came out kind of suggesting it may reduce the biological age. And so they looked at individuals in fasting mimicking diet. I encourage those of you who have not to check it out, check out Walter Longo and so forth. They, that the first five days of the month, having essentially a calorie restricted diet um, that is plant-based and a combination of green teas and other substances, I won't go into it heavily. Um, and what he found is in the previous is that lower diabetes risk factors insulin resistance, A1C. But what they showed too as well is that decrease of that abdominal fat. We know the concept of TOFI. Then on the outside, fat on the inside. You can't always judge a book by its cover. Sometimes people walking around, you think they look great. Inside, they're riddled with this visceral fat. This visceral fat is the stuff that coats the organs and it's the stuff that is metabolically active that leads to insulin resistance, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. So we're understanding that and we're learning more and more and more about these. And so this is what this study showed. They also showed that fasting mimicking diets, they, they seem to increase this lymphoid to myeloid ratio, which is an indicator of a more youthful immune uh, system. And so additional st uh, statistical evaluations showed that that fasting mimicking diet participants have reduced their biological age, a measure of how well one's cells and tissues are functioning, as opposed to chronologic age by two and a half years on average. 
That's powerful. That's powerful. That's good stuff. That once again says that that implies that our DNA is not our destiny, that there is the ability, as more and more science tells us, not only to transform our epigenome, our epigenetics that turn on and turn off disease, but also to pro increase the productivity, the, the, the beneficial effects of our body system. And that's all what we're trying to do is how can we be better in terms of how we are from a society, how we are for our bodies, for our health, to live a life of purpose. So that's the great, the, the great part that's there. So that's the end of uh, what's new in the news, what I could find real quick and brief. Uh, here's some good stuff that we have. And, and upcoming, we'll talk about what's new in the news and, and more exciting information at the upcoming HELP conference. But we'll yeah, dig please, into that a little please bit talk more. about the HELP conference. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that's so great about this thing called the HELP conference and Man, we're, we're having a who's who. So Scott Stoll from Plantrition Project, they do such phenomenal work. And so I, I, I'm so excited to team with them in helping to craft this. And so oftentimes people are kind of thrown off. You say, well, health equity, lifestyle, is that for me? Equity means we want this for everyone. We want everyone to have access to this thing called health. You have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of health is the goal. And so we're bringing in the likes of Kim Williams and Batcha Montgomery, who are doing incredible work in terms of cardiovascular disease. We're bringing in the likes of Milton Mills and Eric Walsh. Some of you guys have become familiar with Eric Walsh, Dr. Walsh through Chef AJ's channel. He does phenomenal work talking about the power of nutrition. Dr. Helen Stoddard, um, on diabetes prevention and reversal and awareness. We're bringing in to as well um, additional individuals, Dr. David Bowman, uh, who's going to speak on maternal and infant and pediatrics of reversing this, this paradigm of, of disease inside of our youth. Great study, I didn't even include that, really about increased consumption of vegetables may be able to stave off inflammatory disease and as individuals, as kids get older. And so there's so much power learning about how we can treat our future. Children are our future, as Whitney Houston sung years ago. Then we're moving on to like mental health and Alzheimer's with, you know, our favorite uh, couple, plant-based couple, Dean and Aisha Shurzai are going to be there, right? And so they do just such phenomenal work in the community, but we're not going to stop there. How many of you guys know that, that you listening out there, that you may make a decision that you want to become healthier, you want to lose weight. That decision doesn't happen in a bubble. Your success doesn't happen in, in a bubble. It requires the community around you. And so that's what we're going to focus on the community in day two. What's the role of the community? Looking at hospital systems. We have to do more as hospitals. So we're bringing in hospital leaders of how we can, can expand beyond our, our boundaries to really deliver this thing of health. What can we do to deliver plant-based nutrition more effectively and efficiently and collaborate with community-based organizations? We're looking at what's the role of places of faith. Those are still central pillars inside of many communities across the United States. How can they play more of a role in the physical health and promote the physical health too as well? What about our schooling system? What can we do more as it relates to our schools to really promote this inside, not only for our youth, I'll tell you, as a father and as a physician, my kids are more inclined to listen to their teachers and they'll come back, even though I've, I've been apostolizing them about the power of plant-based nutrition for years, they'll come back and tell me, oh, dad, you know what my teacher told me? <laughs> they said, you know, you, I guess you were right about such and such. I said, well, thanks. I'm glad that your teacher validated what I had to say. And so we want that to happen more inside of our schools across the country. And so this is one of the, the, the first steps. This is something that we believe that irrespective of your financial strata, irrespective of your, of your political beliefs, irrespective of where you are in the strata of life, you should be able to achieve health um, and achieve it well. So we're having this down in of all places, be surprised. Come on, Alabama out there. We're going to have it in Alabama. They call that the heart attack belt. <laughs> I'm going to call, I want to transform that to the plant-based uh, belt out there. I thought, I thought it was the bacon belt. Yeah, I think so too as <laughs> well. I think so. So we need to, we need, so we need to go to where people are needed the most, <clears throat> where people are needed the most. And so I'll, I'll tell you as an example of why that's so important to me. So you all know I'm a plumber by trade. That's what I get paid to do. And as a plumber, I don't believe in fixing pipes that I can treat by just changing practices. I can transform. But every once in a while, there's a busted pipe I have to go in and take care of. 
And so I have peop- I have patients the other day I was on call and they were, I was there at two o'clock in the morning because they had a busted pipe that I had to go in and help try and take care of them. But my goal is not just to repair the pipe and then to have them go back to what they were doing before. The goal in that moment is to repair the pipe and teach them how not to clog that pipe in the future. And that's what this is about, is about laying the foundation so we can all live our healthiest lives ever and live a life of purpose, right? All right, that's the help conference. That's the help conference. That's what's new in the news, new in the news. Maybe next time I'll do a recap from the help conference of what we learned as part of uh, what's new in the news. So is is the help conference only in person or is there an option to attend virtually for people that can't get to Alabama? It is in person right now. And part of the reason why it's in person is because I'll tell you, there is such power in interaction and collaboration, right? That where you can, your minds can come together and you actually begin to brainstorm on potential possibilities. I was at an event yesterday and giving a talk. And so the power of connecting with individuals right afterwards and how we can transform, you know, the environment that we're in and take it to another level in terms of our nutrition and things of that nature, it was palpable that sometimes you miss a little bit when you're, you know, you're distracted. You know, I imagine those of you out there right now, you're listening but you may be multitasking. You may have Instagram on. You might have so your emails up and you're you're engaged, but you're not fully engaged. And so that's one of the reasons why we really are looking this first year, this inaugural year, is to have this um, in person. That's great. Well, I wish I could attend. All right. So are you ready to dive into a few of the questions that the viewers yeah. have sent in in advance? Okay. Let's do it. Let's All right. do it. We'll start with Billy's question. I'm having an aortic valve replacement soon. Are there any suggestions for me before and after the procedure? Yeah. So I think one is the fact, Billy, that you're listening uh, right now in this moment to this broadcast, I think is it tells me you're in the right direction. So I think everything you can do to bolster your health, health leading up to this in terms of eating robust amounts of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds, Um, are extremely important. And we're going to focus on the seeds more so for the omega components that are there, that when you do that, that's power that's there. I want, you know, we know that there's some studies and you're not going to be able to achieve this to offset the need for aortic valve replacement. But we understand that there's growing studies about if we can decrease that calcium burden in the atherosclerosis, that it may be helpful. And so you're saying a foundation that may be inclined to help. We don't have such evidence yet to may help keep that valve open. But I'll tell you, there's wonderful news about aortic valve replacement. Years ago, all we had was one way of doing aortic valve replacement. And that was by going through your chest, your breastbone. Now we have different strategies. We can go through your breastbone and actually surgically replace it. But we can also go through your groin. And we go through the groin, we're able to go ahead and implant the valve and patients leave the next day and right back up and out. There's certain criteria that come into play. Not everyone's a candidate and and research is kind of help guiding us on which patients are candidates for it. But that's just a little side note nugget for those of you out uh, out there listening. You definitely want to be aware of your options and you definitely want to be aware of the symptoms of aortic valve disease, which is something that is increasing, especially as we age. And so it becomes very important to ask your doc to follow up if you have a heart murmur and ask if there's anything that you need to be aware of or to follow up on. Thank you. Good luck to you, Billy. We wish you the yes. best. He's a, really, he's a great guy. And uh, he's plant-based too. Wonderful. Right. Yep. Thank you. This is from Liz. How can I prevent moderate, moderate aortic insufficiency from becoming more severe or from becoming symptomatic? I'm 70 years old. I've been whole food plant-based for the last three years, mostly about 95% SOS free. Wonderful. It's a great question. So aortic insufficiency is almost, it's once again, dealing with that aortic valve. I always describe the valvular disease as one is it's hard to open that door. Doors real rigid. And the other one is that the door kind of doesn't close fully. It goes the opposite direction. So it allows blood to flow in both directions, which is a problem, problem with aortic insufficiency. And there's not a lot from a lifestyle perspective based on research. But what I could tell you is this, depends on the cause. So in some instances, as a result of the aorta dilating slightly, there can be an increase in aortic insufficiency. Our efforts to 
uh, contain continue on the plant-based diet our efforts for exercise and stress reduction that lower the blood pressure and keep that blood pressure and keep what we call the sheer stress low may be able to help decrease the growth or expansion of the aorta which by 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 default will help slow the progression of aortic insufficiency if that is the, indeed the cause of it um, so we use a lot of times we use medications in order to accomplish that and lowering that sheer stress and lowering the blood pressure. But science has told us the power of nutrition that even studies like the DASH diet, which is not even completely as good as what you're eating, have been demonstrated to reduce the blood pressure by as much as 11 millimeters of mercury on par with our pharmacologic agents. We know that exercise likewise can decrease it. Um, over time by about five or six millimeters of mercury. So there's power in this thing called lifestyle. We know that getting adequate sleep also lowers that stress hormone, which can contribute and improves in terms of blood pressure too as well. So try to make sure your sleep is good um, for seven hours of sleep. Now, these are all things that are, are adjacent, but have not looked, I'm not aware of studies that have looked specifically as it pertains to aortic insufficiency. But remember, it's a, it's a package deal this thing called health. And these things become layered and that's what I'm conveying to you. So there's a lot that you're doing, keep it up and you'll do well. Make sure you ask your doc periodically for the timing of when you need to follow up with an echocardiogram. What causes aortic insufficiency and how do they diagnose it with the echo? Yeah, so one, I'll start first with the latter. So diagnosing aortic insufficiency, our first step for doing that is by listening to you, right? Simple thing of, of putting hands on you and, and listening to you. And we are able to hear in terms of the murmur that occurs at a particular phase of the cardiac cycle. We follow that up if we have suspicion with an ultrasound of the heart, similar to what is done for women with babies, except for the heart, and it's called an echocardiogram. That allows us to visualize the vessels, excuse me, the uh, the valves and look and see what the amount of flow difference is. Another way of doing it is through a, a cardiac MRI can also measure the amounts that are there. Now, the causes can be multifold, right? Sometimes you can have it from an infection on the heart valve that can lead to it. Sometimes you can you can uh, you can have it from uh, rheumatologic issues that are here, or rheumatoid fever that can affect your heart valves. Um, usually it will cause more thickening and stenosis, which is the, the opposite of regurgitation or insufficiency. You can have it from a dilating aortic root. So you imagine this, my door is held up by my door frame. If my door frame expands for some reason, it expands out, that door, that door is not going to close and open effectively. It's going to flap around. And so as your aorta enlarges, that aortic valve that normally is tight here, if I expand, now it's not closing. And so now it can leak back and forth. And so we try and slow that progression. Lots of things can do it. There can be genetic causes, Marfan syndrome, a lot of different things. So it's a multitude of different factors that can play a role. Hypertension can dilate that. Um, so a lot of things can play a role with uh, aortic insufficiency. Thank you. Here's another heart condition that we're getting a question about. This is calcification. It's from Linda. Dr. Batiste, what causes calcification of the aorta and how to heal someone told that is told it happens to old folks? Does it happen mm -hmm. to everybody? <laughs> well, you know, what they're referencing is they're basically telling you that, that when we identify calcium on an imaging study, so oftentimes what happens is that Physicians will go ahead and they'll code or they'll document that there was evidence of calcification to imply atherosclerosis. That's what it implies. So if we see it on a chest X-ray and of some sort or a CAT scan, we may just make mention that there's calcification, which infers atherosclerotic process. So we understand that the process of coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis can begin in childhood and progress throughout life asymptomatically. So we've learned that over the years and science has told us this. And so we understand that there is power in terms of reducing that through our lifestyle choices, that we can decrease and slow that progression. So there's increased studies that tell us about the power of plant-rich nutrition, plant-based nutrition in terms of stalling and halting the progression of atherosclerosis. There's some studies that have suggested it's been somewhat back and forth about the power of even vitamin K2, which is found in fermented foods, 
from a plant-based source, um, NATO, a lot of other types of foods that are there that we'll see that it, um, it may be associated with slowing the progression of this, this atherosclerosis or calcification. So there are things that you can do about it. And that's one of the things that we talk about here is really about the nutrition component. Right, right. Why aren't more cardiologists plant-based, you think? You know, because uh, we, we talk about this all the time, right? It's it's a combination that we all practice from our what we're comfortable with, what we're familiar with. And what you're most familiar with is what you're taught, right? And so if you're taught really about the science of pills and procedures, that's what you're most comfortable with. And what you're uncomfortable with are things that you have no knowledge base. And so... Um, so it takes a while to kind of make, definitely get some acumen to it, despite the fact nearly all the guidelines say class one, the first thing that you should do for high blood pressure, high cholesterol, for chronic staple angina is lifestyle modification. But, but still, we as docs don't know a whole lot. But when you start to dig into it, so the easy default and one of the reasons just tying back into the former question about the, the aortic calcification it's a marker for docs to kind of say, well, let's implement a treatment for that. And that treatment oftentimes is a leapfrog over lifestyle into the use of statins um, and other agents to decrease and normalize the, the, cholesterol, the cholesterol level at that time, decreasing the inflammation. But those are things that you can first say, hey, I'd like to proceed first with lifestyle. You know, I understand that that's an, a reasonable option and present that. And so you have to then make sure you're living a life and then you get, you know, get your blood work checked afterwards and make sure you're doing what you're supposed to and that this is not something genetic with you. A lot of people tell me that they don't feel good when they're on statins. And do they really treat the cause of the problem or do they just treat the numbers? Yeah, it's it's not treating. So, yeah, we know studies and studies and studies. Number one, there's side effects from every medication that we do, side effects of everything that we do. And so understanding that, that there is... Um, a major issue. And then looking, are they really rectifying the issue? If I'm still pouring into my body substances that are, are flaming the fires of inflammation and cholesterol, a lot of times that is the case. A lot of times it's more of that than it is a genetic predisposition towards it. Um, and so lowering that down, I think it ends up being more of an issue. So the answer to your question is, no, no it's not directly taking care of the problem if the problem is sources from our lifestyle. Um, is it working at a biological level of where it's interfering with um, the conversion? <laughs> yeah, it does things like that. But there are aspects that we can do with our nutrition and the fiber to decrease the burden of cholesterol beyond a shadow of a doubt. And we've seen that time and time again, studies that really continually validate that, that fact. Thank you. This question is from Tammy. Is a low resting heart rate a cause for concern? My resting heart rate ranges from 47 to 54 beats per minute. I'm not an athlete. And in fact, I'm overweight. I've had a low heart rate my entire life. As an infant, the doctor told my mother I was lethargic. I have always had low energy and I'm prone to depression. I'm wondering, could there be a connection? I'm a female and I'm 53. Yeah, that's a great question. And so there, it is a marker of something. So it could be a marker. So in, in many instances, so I just had my blood pressure checked, gave my eyes checked for a brief little bit. My blood pressure was great. Thankfully, you never know. Um, my heart rate was in the fifties too, as well. And I was happy immediately. So, you know, that's good. I have, do I feel lethargic? No, I don't. So we know that in individuals who are athletic, we know in individuals who have a, a, a good heart health, that their heart rate can be lower. And that's not something that is concerning, but there also are instances where a low heart rate can be concerning. There can be electrical disturbance that's occurring that may increase your risk of passing out or having um, a sudden stopping of your heart, in which case a pacemaker may be necessary. There could be other instances that are related to an endocrine type of a hormonal issue. The thyroid, a low thyroid count has been associated with, once again, with um, uh, a slow heart rate. It can be associated with um, features in, in, the, in the gut motility and weight gain. And so it becomes important to kind of look at various aspects in conjunction with your providers. It sounds like you've had things that have happened for quite some time in life. And so probably likely many of these um, tests have been explored. If there's nothing obvious, it's not a problem unless you're symptomatic. What does symptomatic mean? You're feeling lightheaded, you're going to pass out, things of that nature. There's a direct correlation, cause and effect. 
And sometimes what we'll do for patients is we'll put you on the treadmill and we'll see, well, let's see if the heart rate increases like it's supposed to. And that will be a clear telltale sign that there's not an intrinsic issue with the heart rate itself. Right. People on uh, that are watching live are saying, well, what numbers are normal? But it doesn't it? I mean, there's a it, wide range it, of what could be normal. It, yeah, there, there is. But there, we call normal in terms of what we call sinus rhythm, normal sinus rhythm, which is the rate that that light switch, if you were listening that I described before, that triggers the heart to beat. We speak about 60 to 100. Um, is the range of norm. And below 60, we characterize that as bradycardia, which means slow, and tachycardia above 100, which means fast. Now, the cause of those things can vary. So obviously, if I'm sleeping, if I'm getting a massage, if I'm relaxed, if I'm in a moment of zen, I've done my meditation, my focused breathing, my heart rate drops, that's not a problem. That's sinus bradycardia. But I'm concerned, is it a normal occurrence of it being slow? Or is it an abnormal occurrence of it being slow? Is it a normal occurrence of it being fast or an abnormal occurrence of it being fast? So when I run real fast or whatever, my heart rate may speed up. If I'm carrying 100 pounds and I'm climbing a fly of stairs, my heart rate may speed up. That's a normal occurrence of it beating fast. But if I'm sitting here talking to AJ, well, maybe I shouldn't use her because she might speed my heart up anyway. But if I'm talking, if I'm sitting here and I'm just quiet and my heart takes off at 130 beats a minute, that's an abnormal occurrence of my heart beating fast. And then the question begins to arise, what is the cause? And that's something I can't answer um, virtually like this in this format here. This is going to require you getting in with your doc and describing things and starting a, the series of testing to explore that a bit more. Great. Thank you. But people can only see you if they're a Kaiser patient, right? That is that is correct. And um, as of the moment, I'm actually not seeing patients right now outside of the procedure area because of administrative duties. Aww. Okay, thanks. This is from Anonymous. I'm 70 in good physical condition with no health problems or diseases, been whole food plant-based, no oil or sugar, limited salt since December, 2021. 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with mild arrhythmia, but didn't require any medication. I've now had more symptoms over the past year or so and have had a loop recorder recently fitted to track what's going on. Could overdosing on vitamins cause increased heart regularities? And then I, um, she writes a whole bunch of stuff. She's on like EPA, DHA, multivitamins, vitamin D, B12. And she takes Nuprin, l and MacQ Shield Original. Hmm. Hmm. So that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a, that's a, lot a, that's a mouth. That's a mouthful. <laughs> a lot of swallowing every day. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You know, so... Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know for certain in terms of whether or not there is a distinctive relationship between um, the 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 aggregate of vitamins that you're taking. There has been some relationship between some of the omega consumption and irregular heartbeats. I think the first step is what the docs are doing is the most correct to figure out whether or not what you're perceiving in terms of symptoms is actually actually related to the heart rhythm, and if it is then now it's the time to act and figure out, well, what does heart arrhythmia mean? Sometimes you can have a skip beat. So the way I describe a skip beat, we call premature ventricular contractions, atrial contractions. That can be like if someone is singing and they sing out of tune. Now, for some people, it bothers them. Other people, it doesn't. Most of us have skip beats. Some people, it bothers. Other people, it doesn't. Then you can have different types that are like atrial fibrillation. You can have fast runs of, of different heartbeats that some of which are easily treatable. Some are more difficult to treat. Some of these fast heart rhythms can lead to other events like stroke and other issues like atrial fibrillation that we have to take seriously and look at. Then you can have some that are very life-threatening. So it's a whole entire spectrum as it relates, relates to electrical disturbances, very similar if you had an electrical issue in your house, that can mean a lot of different things. Um, and so we have to first determine that. And then based upon that, we're able to dig into a bit more into some of the supplements that you're taking and figure out if there's a relationship. Thank you. And she could probably find a plant-based cardiologist that would see her. You know, there are ones that do virtual or depending on where she lives, she might be able to find one, actually. This Absolutely. is from Drew. 
Is the SOS-free whole food plant-based lifestyle helpful to valvular heart disease in any direct way, or would the benefit come exclusively from keeping arteries open and cholesterol lower so as to not further tax the valves? Could a vegan diet have a negative effect on the prolapsed regurgitating valves, i.e. making them more, even less effective due to possible lower consumption of protein and any impact that might have on the valve's connective tissue? Yeah, so great question. So first I'll start with the the um, beginning portion of the question is that when we look at the power of lifestyle as it pertains to progression of, of valvular heart disease, there are no direct studies that tie together. There's been a lot, of, a lot of work that's been done about, there's two types of valvular issues. Let me take a step back. There's one in which the valve doesn't open well, and there's one in which the valve doesn't close well. That leads to too much leakage. And so there's been a lot of research looking at the valves that don't close well called stenoses, um, excuse me, that don't open well called stenoses. And in those, there is a distinct relationship to atherosclerosis. And so there, there's even work that was done looking at the use of statins and trying to decrease the burden. Does it slow the progression? Um, there's none that I'm aware of to date that have looked at aggressive plant-based nutrition and looking at valvular progression as a distinct one-to-one -one in looking at outcomes. But if I take a tangential uh, line of thought and I say, well, if I believe that there is a relationship between the atherosclerotic process and valvular stenosis, then methods to decrease or reduce the burden and slow the burden of atherosclerosis would therefore help and be applied to valvular stenosis, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's how a leapfrog can be made by saying that if I'm making plant-based, if I'm eating a healthful whole food plant-based diet, it may slow the progression of valvular stenosis. And that's where we kind of go along those, those lines like that not taking into account rheum rheumatic fever or some other things that trigger an inflammatory response apart from nutrition. We're speaking specifically as it relates to the, the generic atherosclerotic process. In terms of being very specific, in terms of if there is some negative impact because of lack of absence of protein consumption on things like mitral valve prolapse and from a connective tissue disorder perspective, First, we understand that there is generally an overconsumption of protein and there is an adequate consumption of, pro of protein in individuals who engage inside of a diverse plant-based dietary uh, pattern, eating pattern. So we know that. So it's not an issue of lack of protein in most individuals. It's more of an issue of an overprotein, which is interesting going back to what's new in the news, how the say was kind of relating to this overconsumption increases the atherosclerotic risk that's there. Um, in terms of connective tissue, there's once again, no studies outlining that any nutritional dietary eating pattern is related to mitral valve prolapse or progression towards the leakage called mitral regurgitation as a result of prolapse. Prolapse tends to be, you're correct, a connective tissue um, issue that happens in, in terms of prolapse um, in many instances, I'll say, and myxomatous valves, but prolapse can happen also from ischemia. Prolapse can happen from other um, uh, factors too as well. So long-winded answer, yes, plant-based nutrition can affect stenotic valves. I believe based on the atherosclerotic hypothesis, if it holds true, although not proven in literature, and in terms of mitral valve prolapse, I'm not aware of any data looking at nutrition directly or indirectly, nor about the direct association of the atherosclerotic process with uh, mitral prolapse or mitral or regurgitant uh, valvular issues, including the aortic valve or mitral valve. Thank you. We've got a live viewer on Instagram called Soulful, Tr Soulful Tramp that's asking, I've been waking up in the middle of the night with a racing heart, pounding fast. I'm a 61-year-old woman. Maybe she had a bad dream. I, I had uh, yeah, you know, so a couple of things. One is, you know, I think whenever we're awake in the middle of the night, if that's recurring, and your heart rate's faster. The first thing I typically will go down the road when I'm with patients is about their sleep pattern. Are they at risk for sleep apnea? That maybe the combination of, of lack of air is triggering the heart rate to beat faster, which you know there's a direct relationship potentially between sleep apnea, which you can't judge based off of size alone. Individuals can be prone to a sleep apnea irrespective. Um, so that's something I look at. The other one is an inherent arrhythmia, as we've talked about already on this show that may be um, present there. So looking at that, 
um, I think can play a significant role. If there's any alcohol consumption around that time, because alcohol can also trigger um, this too as well. Presumptively, there's not stimulants, but if there's stimulant consumption too as well, can trigger the sense of the heart racing. Um, so it goes back to the basics. One is you've already identified when this is happening, how long it happens, how you feel when it happens. And then I present that information to your doc. And, and the normal way is if it happens on a daily basis, predictable like clockwork, having your wear a monitor for 24 hours probably is reasonable. If it's happening periodically, maybe wearing a monitor that is taking place over a course of a month may be more beneficial. That way you increase the odds of capturing whatever the symptom that you're experiencing and see if it matches with what your heart rate is doing. But those are the general recommendations, not specific to you. It's uh, because it's hard for me to be able to provide that over the, the airways. You know, you did a previous episode where you interviewed, I, I, I can't remember the specialty, I want to say urologist, where you guys really talk about the effect of alcohol. It was brilliant. I wish I could remember that episode. Well, I think it was the urologist that you interviewed when you talked yeah, about Yeah, I, de I definitely, yeah, with Dr. Q. We yeah, went, that was, uh, that that was, if you want to learn about the effect of alcohol, you want to learn the truth about alcohol, watch that episode. I will find it and link to it. So another live viewer, this one on YouTube, I apologize. I don't know if it's Sherry or Cherie, but she's asking what causes premature atrial contractions and do, does it always lead to AFib? So great, great question. I'm going to start at the end. So I don't know what, what, uh, is, well, no. At the end means no, there's not a direct relationship with with atrial with premature atrial contractions and atrial fibrillation. Now we do know that you can have inside of the near the pulmonary veins that this is where it, it triggers atrial fibrillation in some individuals, and sometimes an ectopic beat like atrial contraction can start that process occurring. Um, but it's not typically cause and effect in general sense of atrial premature atrial contractions and development of atrial fibrillation. In terms of what causes the premature atrial contractions, I'm not sure. A lot of different things. We look at electrolyte imbalance, look at potassium, magnesium, um, calcium. At times, we look at the, whether or not there's been a lot of research around the hydration, a lot of research around a uh, caffeine uh, consumption, and whether or not it triggers the ex the in increase um, what we call beta adrenergic response and triggering that that stimulates the heart to beat faster that may trigger the extra extra beats um so it varies and so we but it is something that we observe commonly the atrial contractions and premature matricular contractions inside of individuals and we see it more frequently as as individuals from a hormonal stance that we see it start to happen during pregnancy we see it start to happen as well during menopause too, as well for some women that they may experience and, and become more symptomatic from the extra beats. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. This is from Instagram, mm -hmm. Diana House. I've had two SCADs. I am learning this is a split in the endothelial lining. Any recommendations? I do not have indicators in the aorta or carotid maybe you can talk about what a scad is yeah so so that's one of the, this is one of the things that happen when it comes to cardiovascular disease and one of the ill effects in women so spontaneous coronary artery disease dissection right spontaneous coronary artery dissection is what this is scad represents and so a dissection i always describe it to patients it's kind of like it's like this if you ever ever purchase a nice pair of slacks or pants that have that lining on the inside and if you are putting those pants on all the time and every, you start to create like a little hole between the lining and the there and your foot goes down the wrong hole and it tears, right? You're never going to get to the in and out that's there. That's the same thing that can happen inside the endothelium, that a small tear is created. And now blood starts to travel down that area, dissecting or splitting or separating out this, this lining that's there. And that can lead to pain, obviously, as the true lumen is not receiving enough blood flow, which means the muscle through the true lumen that's there. And so it's something that requires healing over time. And this is a growing area. It's something observed more in women than it is in men. It's something that's a growing area of research that, to be honest with you, we don't have great treatment for. We know that surgery is not effective. We know that stenting is not effective. We try and uh, place certain medications. We're not sure about the effects of, of statins, although we'll We'll recommend it. We'll use certain class of medications called beta blockers. So it becomes an endothelial. So I advise my patients, if this is an endothelial issue, we need to make sure we transform your endothelium as much as possible. Do I have direct scientific research-based 
evidence looking at survivors or individuals with spontaneous artery dissection and seeing the effects of aggressive plant-based, whole food plant-based nutrition in that segment, I don't. So I'm basically using information gathered from other data points that tell us about the impact and the restorative effects of the endothelium from nutrition, from stress reduction, all these aspects to try our best to stabilize this. We're all about stabilizing the lining of the vessels in that moment. And by doing so, as an additive, we may be able to prevent future events. And that's really the goal. Great. Okay. I, I said I was going to let you go, but this question just came in and I, it, I'm, I'm curious myself from Dina. When you talked about artificial sweeteners and soda causing an increase in AFib, does that also include things like stevia or monk fruit, Lohan, et cetera? You know, that article did not, I'm going to assume that it is in reference to, it's a, it's, I'm going to extrapolate that out to all artificial sweeteners, to be honest with you, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm looking at the study, and remember, what's new in the news was just a quick little survey of me kind of glancing over a bunch of stuff, but like headline news, I didn't dig into it, but I did look a little bit, and they were looking specifically at a subset inside of uh, of these sodas and other, other components that are there. I think it's an easy, reasonable leap to say, you know what? we should probably back off of all artificial sweeteners, you know, as it relates to this risk. If we're looking, there's so much growing data as it relates to artificial sweeteners and adverse health outcomes. This is just another nail in the coffin of the use of it in my mind. It's like, you know, and so individually, you're, uh, we're going to have to determine how many nails do we need for us to finally give it up. But it's another nail in that coffin about, I need to be careful about my consumption of these artificial sweeteners. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dr. Batiste, this was wonderful. I love the combination of a few slides and a few questions. And if Dr. Desmond can come back at another time, we'd love to learn about the, I love the title that you gave them, the way through the heart is through the colon. That was very intriguing. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's, a, it, I wish I could take credit for that, but they've known for years a way to a man and woman's heart is through their stomach. And, and there's so much truth in that statement that's there as what science is telling us with the microbiome and this connectivity between the mind and the gut, the heart and the gut. And so, yeah, it's, it's great information out there. He sends his apologies. And I look forward to it again next time. It would have been and great because I believe he, isn't he Irish and today's St. Patrick's. That's day. right. That's right. That's it would right. Have been perfect. It would have been perfect. You know, I, I, I'm, I notice your scrubs and it says plant-based on it. Do you actually wear those when you're seeing patients? Are you allowed to do that? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, it's, um, uh, I don't have any restrictions in what I like that. You know, I'm not, I'm not advocating that's not, that's something that's not science-based. So whether or not it's my scrubs, whether or not it's my green sheet I give to patients, whether or not it's um, information on plant-based nutrition or discussion of seeing patients to Chef AJ's uh, channel to learn more. Those are all things within the the, the proscribe of, of health delivery. Well, it's a great conversation starter, I'm sure. Absolutely. All Absolutely. right, Dr. Patisse, such a pleasure spending Sunday morning with you as always. Oh, the same. Appreciate and it. We will see you soon. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time for plant-based dietitian Deepa Deshmukh. She's going to be talking about using ethnic foods as superfoods. Take care, everyone.